Hello everyone. Welcome to tonight's episode, which is titled Eternal Visitations of the Dawn of Man. And so, to dive into this talk, I would like our attention to go to the fact that the sun rises every day to the subjective landscapes and simulations of reality through the utilization of language, abstraction, and duality. Just like how we open our eyes, and that's a sort of light in the room, a light of attention. Just the fact that the earth is spinning around the sun for the creatures on earth and when I say creatures on earth it, whenever you want to make something profound you just have to increase its scale that means you gotta see its interconnectivity you gotta see the in, in, in some sense the inseparability and the new interconnectivity of the uh, macrocosm with the microcosm. So what I'm kind of saying here, guys, is that our species, they say 99.9% .9 of species, you know, go extinct. So our species is going to go extinct. But then we see the sun rises and life forms on this planet constantly awaken. So in some sense, how profound of a picture is this? That through a certain geometrical relationship, waves are hitting this sphere to, in some sense, uh, um, <clears throat> fill it with light, intelligence. When we look at our intelligence, we cannot avoid color, we cannot avoid sight. Because sight is being the world we are in, we see we are in a world of our senses. Now, what you see, there's something cool about it. It's prior to you having any thought to any object in this existence, that object is in some sense itself, uh, it, it, like as the Buddha, let's, say, let's take the Buddhist route. The Buddha says it's uh, all the, the nature. Once it is witnessed, or in some sense concluded as a living uh, creature on this planet that we're on. <clears throat> you know, light is so significant to the intelligence of the creatures on this planet that through light there is a visibility to respond to, to even have the emergence of an identity that has a free will in, on a rock in the middle of nowhere. Do you see? I was wondering, like, what is the greatest knowledge to have? You know, I remember when I was younger, um, let's just uh, take this pathway, <laughs> like, let's sidetrack for a second, I want to share this. When I was younger, I heard a story, and it was a story of this poet named Jalaluddin Maulana Rumi. I heard this, I think, when I was like 15 or something. And uh, it, this story was a story of, uh, about this very profound ancient Persian poet. I say ancient, but it's not, it was like, I don't know, 700 years ago. And um, <clears throat> this poet, Jalaluddin Maulana Rumi, he was in his mid-twenties sitting by a fountain reading this science book and back in the day there weren't that many and to even have access to one was a rare occurrence. So Rumi's sitting there reading this science book. Out of nowhere, this spiritual pilgrim or as they would say back in the day, this spiritual wild man appears. You know, this kind of traveling uh, kind of hermit or wise man, you know. I wouldn't for say, her say hermit, but you know. <clears throat> This uh, dervish by the name of Shams Tabrizi comes to this kid, comes to Rumi, and comes to Rumi and says, hey kid, what are you reading? Like out of nowhere, this guy popped out of nowhere, and he's like, what are you reading? And Rumi tells him, <coughs> excuse me, 
Rumi tells him that this is the newest sciences of the uh, of the time, and it's nothing you will un you can you can understand, old man, right? So Shams gets mad. He takes the book, throws it in the water. Rumi gets shocked. He's like, "Oh my God, this man has just savagely destroyed you know like one of the last books. Like you know, it's like they have photocopy machines back in the day. So like it was a destruction of knowledge when a piece of paper with ink fell into." you know water so so in in some sense Rumi this kid looks at this madness in front of him like that's happened and he looks at Shams and he's like you have destroyed the newest knowledge of our time why why did you do this and he's like in this anger and shock you know and uh Shams this man the spiritual wild man suddenly picks up the book from the fountain gives it to Rumi and Rumi gets shocked on another level. Like he gets overwhelmed because the book is not wet as if it had never fallen, as if it had never fallen into the water. Shams turns around to Rumi and says, knowledge that could be wiped with water is not real knowledge at all. And the reason I'm sharing this story is because its significance is that it is, it is, it is inspiring the listener to seek knowledge or ways of knowing things or a sort of knowingness or, or knowinghood, <laughs> whatever word you want to use, but like a sort of knowing that remains because everything is temporary. So we are in some sense these limited time alive in this way kind of beings trying to figure out the secret of all secrets, which is in a logical or analytical way to understand God, to understand God's mind by denying Him, and the moment you deny something, you change something, you chain that to yourself. So pretty much what I'm saying is in a world where there's this endless cycle and our species, you know, like it will eventually go extinct and perhaps new species will arise or different things will happen, you know, but it's one of those things that we are experiencing a tiny bit of a participation in an infinite cycle of changing manifestation. When I say manifestation, it doesn't mean it is physical or non-physical. It means it is a relationship with reality that is still limited to image. So if your truth has to make sense to you, has to be visible in your senses, but if the truth is beyond your sensory perception, not in your range of, uh, in your antenna range of awareness, you know, well, guess what? You will deny an exploration that its denial is ignorance. Our species has to be catalyzed. That's the purpose of the past, to just inspire the present moment to go to the future. I mean, what other purpose do you have? You know, I, I remember hearing this um, a very profound sage and yogi by the name of uh, Papaji, you know, and Papaji was a disciple of Sri Ramana Marshi, and Muji is a disciple of Papaji, you know. And so Papaji, this man suddenly, yes, he's in the satsang. So in India, they have this very profound culture of having these spiritual gatherings where it's kind of like a, like like the song of the sage, I can say, or or I could say it like this: it is it is like a sort of collective updating of awareness. Papaji says, the past is a graveyard and thus suggests the mind is a graveyard. That means right now, if you ask me to explain anything, in order to be, to be able to have that thing, to be dynamic in meaning, it must be fragmented and segmented into different time periods. Right? So in order for the character in our own stories of, uh, in, in our own stories of life that are occurring behind our eyes, 
You know, there's a there's a story of there's there's a life that you're that's happening in front of your eyes, but very playfully, Mr. Within says there's a life that's occurring behind your eyes. And when I say Mr. Within, guys, I'm referring to my uh, collective self in some sense because I believe you cannot be an individual without a collectivity and you cannot have a collective experience without an individual individuality so what I mean by that is I, I enter actually believe it or not I think I was born atheist I think I was born like like complete like Zen master level. <laughs> you know <clears throat> What I mean by that is that what I think when I say when I was born atheist is that when I was born, I had no idea on any idea or on anything. I was not established as an individual position behind my eyes to be able to relate to the world and to speak in sophisticated ways where in some way it is as elegant as like that Slumdog Millionaire movie where it's as if regardless of the wrong right answer or wrong answer, that moment must occur in that way. Regardless of our errors or our success. The species must continue and it must continue with greater vision or what the hell are we doing with our technology? You know, if technology is limiting the vision, which comes down to the self-awareness of the being by limiting the physical self of that being or the attent subjective self of that being, the attention. You know, I have, I've realized that it's, it, it, that it's important we acknowledge these two realities, the subjective realm and the objective realm. And then there's something beyond these two also, right? But for now, let's just create a society that doesn't have to think, you know, we are souls or doesn't have to think like, you know, we have free will or we don't have free will. You know, let us just consider, okay, we, are, we have an objective experience and then there's some superior subjective phenomena occurring over this objective experience, which seems to be fueled by like this uh, empty witness that is the moment prior to anything in it. Right. So it was very chaotic and I'm, I'm kind of like rambling on here, but I think I, I should because, you know, bulldozers are designed for that. <laughs> and so I, I kind of like have this vision that one must stand how much of our intelligence is just governed by a pattern repeating itself. A system sleeping, waking up, trying to repeat the pattern, sleeping, trying to repeat the pattern. You know, someone can playfully create a philosophy, call it pa pa like patternism. <laughs> I don't know, something like that. People are like, what is patternism? You know, and like, let's say like in this hypothetical, like, let's say futuristic kind of like, okay, let's, not, let's say in a parallel reality, some, some philosopher came and said, guys, you know, I'll call it a religion, science, whatever you like. I, I have this philosophy called paternism. Uh, paternism patternism <laughs> and so like people are like what is this philosophy man what do you mean it could be a religion and a science at the same time and then the guy's like okay guys this is uh, like pretty much religion and ev every everything in existence is a story that's how it becomes accessible to a sort of individual uh, aspect or identity you know <laughs> I've had good things happen recently, so I'm in like this kind of like, re like, ex like a sort of subjective rebellious freedom, which one begins to see that their life doesn't have to be defined by any belief. At the same time, one realizes, okay, let's agree, so your life doesn't, you don't need to believe something, right? Then you see, at the same time, you don't need to disbelieve something because belief and disbelief will be subject to a spectrum of time that considers a sort of past, present, future to the, the, the time to the trio, you know? <laughs> a living creature wakes up goes outside and begins to see dawn. Imagine like this wallpaper I have for this talk, right? The desktop, like, you know, picture <laughs> I found online like this. Imagine the dawn, okay? Like I feel this is dawn, maybe it could be sunset, I don't know. But like imagine just the repetition of a connection of direct light with the surface of a planet. It's honestly designed like a machine, the universe. But the strange thing is, 
who designed the machine and thus there can never be a machine without a spirit prior, without an awareness, there can't be an existence. You know, this is why I, I, in my book, I like an evolutionary return to nature, I wrote like the spirit has been uh, in the machine uh, so long that it has, oh my God, I forget, it has structured the world through something like, I don't know, structured the world through advanced robots that could get angry at us, Some, something like that. I think that that's the exact line. But what do we do with a waking repetition of manifestation and experiencing this up and down energy wave? We see either our technologies are going to, both inner and outer technologies, are going to move towards giving the person a, a sort of... Um, it's as if like an updating system deserves to live, okay? That's... It might be a bit difficult to kind of like relate to that, I guess. <sighs> Being visited by a certain pattern of phenomena, the concept of paternism, patternism, could imply that the meaning of life is to experience greater patterns of experience. And these patterns require one to attain at first a pure experience, as if like before you want to see what you believe in, you want to see what you are that you even, like who, who is even believing what I, like what you believe, right? So that's when self-inquiry begins. When the dimension of self-inquiry begins, in some sense, like what that means is that you're beginning to reestablish your relationship with the known and the unknown. Like that's why there's people still in the world talking about spiritual experiences because they experience unique moments where their relationship with the known and the unknown has changed. And when I say their relationship with the known and the unknown, the most inferior form is the movement of manifestation, you know? So what I mean by that is like, for example, somebody levitating something physically or somebody like bringing something into manifestation or whatever that is inferior in um universal intelligence because greater universal intelligence works with multiple worlds at the same time so think of it this way that we were this point like i don't want to say point but this snowball of attention evolving itself existence through a biological animal so as if like this biological animal like had nothing to say no thoughts until one moment it was like whoa who's that what's that reflection in the pond and the moment that occurred we, it, it's kind of like implies there has all, like there is an eternal uh, uh being within you right and this eternal being will begin to become attributeless in a changing world when i was young Right? I had this thought. I'm like, okay, let's say God, the religion is a riddle. You know, not some, some, something. What if religion is a puzzle? It is a unique ancient puzzle still kept. And what is the point of this puzzle? You know, for most people, its interpretation is like have faith in a bigger truth at the same time listen to that bigger truth and realize that you get closer to truth by being submissive <clears throat> and i find that there's nothing per se wrong with that because if you like socrates said the only true wisdom is to know that you know nothing and so when a being begins to ask questions let's say you don't believe in god you're just scientifically asking questions eventually the arena of exploration of experimentation you know becomes so vast, you can't possibly get an index of all phenomena to conclude a certainty. So science, even though it, 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 it in some sense puts a very profound banner higher than religion in today's society,
it is rejecting certainty due to the unknown being able to update. Human beings fundamentally have to just confront few things. I think a human life is not really complex. It can become infinitely complex. You can le legit add layers of opinion over your opinions. You know, it happens even in your subconscious, but many people don't realize it. Like it, like for me, my experience with the unknown and with the subconscious came through a sort of pattern breaking because of a, a, an intersection of an awareness to another pattern simultaneously occurring. You know, as if like, like I'll give you an example. Like imagine there's like um, a band. Like this is pretty much like similar to kind of Plato's work. But I guess I'll create a, I'll create, I'll adapt a modern version. Um, imagine there's a drummer, and this drummer has no idea who's behind him, but and he's never played the drum. Let's say he's instantaneously becoming a drummer by just holding the drum, <laughs> and he's he hits he hits one like he hits the drum, and let's say instantaneously when he does this, there's like a like a bunch of people with different instruments just trying to plan to same time this guy plays to play. Okay, so that person will go on believing that the sound of a drum is like the sound of five instruments at once. But when it suddenly begins to realize it's not, it's only one instrument, but simultaneously other instruments are playing at the same time. It's not just one sort of universe. There's eight billion other universes of living beings on this planet occurring at the same time. So what we share is the sameness in the experience of the moment of our time, right? Because time is not a tangible thing. Time is an observation. Space is an observation which come down to the observer. So science is all quantum physicists and every person who creates a, for, a like a theory of uh, a macrocosm will eventually find that that theory cannot pass the test of all the different worlds that are going to look upon that idea. Right? So ideas are not per se even the too important, even though I, I, at, at the era that I'm alive right now in 2019, I have to say they are incredibly, they should be treated as if they're incredibly important. But overall, right, for, an, for, for let's say an enlightened civilization, an enlightened civilization doesn't need that. An enlightened civilization has tapped into a sort of collective as if like all wars have become in some sense internalized and all peace has been externalized we're just replacing it instead of trying to find inner peace in a messed up outer world we want to create a peaceful outer world and then immediately in some sense push the chaos of our lives in our inner realm where we can instantaneously banish it through a change of our attention your attention is key it like it, let me tell you this you will become a master in this existence by studying how your attention is being the moment which is being the mind of the world that's it study how you are being a being in a world where all that is being is on a rock in emptiness or what seems to be empty but filled with intelligent design and I'm not using intelligent design in, in, uh, I'm using it in a unique way that when you look at the designs of matter, there is an intelligence at work. There are forces ch shifting worlds. <clears throat> so pretty much what I'm saying is that when one is caught in a cycle, they will, after being constantly in that cycle, suddenly notice things that they haven't noticed before. Once they notice the di this difference, you see like, man, there's two ways of kind of like liberation. Either you liberate the world or you liberate the self or you find the eyes of the witness beyond, the, uh, which is a greater, superior li uh, a sort of liberation. Because honestly, like, why would I be giving these talks, guys? Let me tell you why. Because we're all alive once. And regardless of what ideology like fashion clothing we put on in various moments, we are changing beings. And by being changing beings, our patterns don't stop. 
we do like the uh, observation is an evolutionary uh, either symptom or force. It's either an evolutionary cause or an evolutionary effect or both. Because what is the value of multidimensionality when one dimension still has no idea how to handle it? So you cannot access greater worlds of shape. You cannot act, act let's say, playfully. I'm saying this, you cannot access higher dimensions of existence and experience unless you find a responsibility that can see beyond your expectation. When you can see beyond your own expectations, you have found in some sense the, uh, what some say, the eternal observer of the moment. Let us say that back in the day in ancient Egypt, <clears throat> people um, thought the sun was a god. Let's just say, I'm not an expert on this, I've just heard the idea, but I want to play with the idea for a second, right? Entertain the idea. So, so, so people, let's say at some point on this planet, looked at the sun and they're like, yo, everything's coming from that, that's God. <laughs> okay. Now, as there are cycles and as there is night and day, these creatures who have considered the sun to be a god begin to see that they have established relationship as if God visits them at dawn, as if the world wakes up when light finds a moment of complete alignment with the surface of the earth, even though the light is not like I'm, I'm like some like some people might think like I'm thinking of it as in, in a sort of clockwork gears kind of thing, um, <clears throat> I'm thinking of it more in the sense that pretty much what I'm trying to say with this title is that there is a profound relationship with a cycle that comes across as a sort of divine chaos and divine order. When I say divine chaos, divine order, that occurs when the idea of the being feels it has tapped into a macrocosmic self. A macrocosmic self is pretty much an endless mind or an edgeless mind, or I can say a limitless uh, a limitless attention as if imagine your eyes never close and never open even though sight changes as if there is an attention within you that when you open your eyes and when you close your eyes it knows there is something here aware Because we can't, it's like we're too many people and we can't, like, I don't know what what's the Western New Age movement, like, spiritual movement is doing. Like, you can't try to recreate ancient India in 2019, you know? Even though their cultures and their kingdoms were very enlightened, and not just ancient India, around the world there were many enlightened civilizations, many enlightened kings, that wisdom was was a sort of, like... <clears throat> wisdom was their uh, the king of kings because I'll tell you this would you rather speak to a wise man or a knowledgeable man assuming the one who's wise 100% will tell you something wise and the one who's knowledgeable will 100% tell you who's knowledgeable if you could only meet one of those beings who would you listen to I personally would listen to the wise man because his wisdom means like knowledge can mean like the person just knows different things, a lot of different ideas, you know, like a monkey jumping from branch to branch. Or <laughs> the person is in some sense 
the foundation of the design of their intelligence. That's a high level of responsibility where you realize like when you take a shower, you are being your own God, cleaning the filth of your, you know, <laughs> of your, you know, biological, you know, like, you know, body. So pretty much I'm saying that we notice there's a sort of self-preservation mechanism at work and we have to be very careful as, as creatures not to interpret the self natural cyclical self-preservation methods of nature as, as a sort of divine God. Do you see what I mean? We can't make anything external really God. Like you can try, right? People can go believe that dude's God. People can go believe like, you know, like different forms get them close to God or not to God. But for me, the moment I realize I'm not just a body that has a brain that just in certain periods projects a, 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 a sense of mind, but I'm actually, how can I say this? Gazing through the lens of the mind as a body in the waking state. It appears to my personal, to, to my, like it, that's, that's more intuitive to me. That eternity was here first. That's why temporary, like we, like the cause is eternal. The effect is temporary. Me and you have incarnated in the effect of a sort of uh, <clears throat> unseeable, like we can't see it. It's either too, too in the past or just beyond our minds or whatever, right? Pretty much there is an unknown cause to our knowledge, to the effect that is our knowledge. And wisdom begins when you tap into a sort of mysterious awakening, this excitement that fills conditioned way of thinking, being shaped into a certain way. As if, believe it or, believe it or not, I feel like when I was born, I was thrown in ideological dirt. But I had to, because you got to get your hands dirty when you want to get to work. <laughs> so what that means is you got to embrace the chaos. And the moment you become responsible for the chaos, you instantaneously get a greater ability to become responsible for the order. What does that mean? That means when a person goes through an intense experience, afterwards, experiences of lesser intensity are be, have become experiencedly easy to navigate through because there is a sort of climate of self-interpretation uh, that occurs in every moment of the being's attention. You know, either you are oneself or you are endlessly different variations of, you know, the same self. The Patanjali Yoga Sutras explain consciousness in a very beautiful way. I think this can contribute to, um, <clears throat> to academia and scientific circles. So if anybody hears what I'm saying, like run to, to your local university and spread the word. <laughs> spread the word of ancient mystical ideas, you know. <laughs> My greatest fascination was like, the notion of deception and honestly i i man i'm like that guy honestly in this period of my life i've written so many different books that are unpublished or in some sense i've drawn out the basic blueprints for the books and i just have to write them with my own poetic like improvisation the moment i write them but i'm kind of telling you like the source of language was a book I worked on, which was a series of essays and a series of entries. And, and the source of language was making the suggestion that what is the source of language, whatever physical thing we conclude that is producing language, is being observed by an unknown viewer that thinks it's a thought that accepts an abstract body, which gives it access to also an abstract world. This is why without names, we're just shapes. <laughs> 
But names are shapes which are kind of like this faster dimension that we create and put um, layer upon our most immediate meaningless reality. So I can tell you pretty much the reason music is very profound for many people and has a healing quality is because it is out of nothing bringing an intelligent movement. And there's a way of kind of observing intelligent movement and getting inspired. And then there's a way where you realize, oh my God, inspiration and motivation do not come from outside of you. The only advice, the only self-help advice in this existence that I believe is be aware of yourself beyond the self that is aware. For dawn will continue to eternally visit the surface of this planet. Our species may end. It may leave off some sort of energetic residue or, or it may all be like a sort of remote control way of the world happening. Because if the world was was a remote control, I mean like this is such a simple theory, but it's just incredibly profound because it means the source can never be found. But the manifestation of the signal in the remote control car or the remote control world is occurring. It is occurring based on the command of a level of intelligence that is inaccessible to that which is being moved by a certain force. And I find that honestly, there's a part of this universal sector, or sometimes I've pondered that it could have been a mo one moment in history where all of reality is originating from, right? Different, some philosophers, I don't remember their names to be honest like that, I think they were European though. They had this philosophy, these European philosophers that that all of history is occurring in 1948. I could be wrong with the European philosophy, but just some philosopher has set this idea, right? That all of existence is occurring in one moment. That means like all that we think is 2010, uh, sorry, 2019, it's still 1948 and all this is a sort of simulation. You know, like it's as playful as that, you know? I don't know what else to say, to be honest. All I, all I do, kind of when I give these talks, is I, get, I sit down and I try to honestly look at the world. And then some, somehow I notice these subtle patterns of movement. As if, like, most people, it's not that they're not creative. It's that they, are, they have not studied how their mind is being the appearance of a life. And to study this doesn't mean, doesn't mean you got to go to India and live in a cave. It doesn't mean like you got to suddenly change everything. You have to trust life. Because the universe has trusted you to exist in design. We as human beings have this added dimension of, a pers of, of, of personalities. And this added dimension of personalities uh, gives us different layers of meaning that we can put. So when someone reads a lot, they're pretty much getting access to many different patterns. When they suddenly hear something, all those patterns try to somehow relate. And the mind is not just some sort of machine that's the sophisticated advanced pattern recognition thing. It's like, it's not, it's kind of like, and I consider it to be a sort of biological antenna, multidimensional antenna, where in a subtler manner, everything that the being thinks is existing, but it's existing to a subtler self. You know, you can't enter another world and accept to be the same man. And the moment you enter that world and you're no longer the same man, you were never the man you were before. Which implies that we, we don't just experience a, 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 a plethora or an instantaneous, simultaneous, multidimensional 
like intersection of different dimensions of intelligence at work, you know, different energy levels, let's say, different significances of attention. Because to be honest, there can be disembodied beings, which are just moments, like space could be alive. We could all just like how the cells in your body are kind of like, because they are in the body, they, they are connected to the whole body. So we are like this conscious bubbles of space that the moment there, bu the bubble pops, the material experience goes, we are in some sense like moments of presence. For me, I was like, is eternity a game? Does, does God think eternity is a game to create creatures that endlessly uh, like open their eyes and close just to realize their eyes were never physical? Like, what is this? And why are we here? And the way I've kind of understood it is that I can't explain this dimension by only being in this dimension. And if... The mainstream does not allow you to see beyond the room you're in. You'll never know there's room, greater rooms to this cosmic house we're in, which is both inner and outer. There is a convergence. That is the mind. I personally say the mind is, in some sense, the bridge between your inner and outer world. From the outer world, different experiences can translate into a sort of abstract, uh, poetic shifting of the belief of the man be, uh, in the mirror that is behind the eyes of, uh, that is not behind, that is in some sense the whole moment. When you take responsibility as, a, as your whole moment of being, I playfully consider that like I will congratulate a being. Who, who uh, has understood that they are their whole moment, they're not just like an aspect of their moment. And the reason they're their whole moment is because inevitably this small humankind wants to do such such big things, wants to help the world because the world has helped bring, raise it from the dirt, right? So because of this, in, 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 like, you know, built is in harm. We will become a species of such advanced intelligence the moment there is like let's say an alien invasion, suddenly all of humanity's genius will unify because something is threatening our species. Do you see our, our egos are sort of protective mechanisms for our uh, material existence? You know, so I, I'm not like a fan of somebody who's just, just telling you like, I mean, honestly, I can say it because there are different altered states of consciousness for me when I speak. It's not like uh, there's one way to how something can be looked at. It's just that we got to figure out the one who's looking at it. What does that signify or what is the significance of consciousness for in regards to just limiting identity to a material existence? This is life. You are the only person who can revalue your moment of being. Nobody can change you because your free will dictates how it interprets any sort of change. So for me, for people who go through rough experiences uh, often, Remember, complexity originates from simplicity. Even science tells us through the theory of the Big Bang that it was all a simple pool of energy, let's say. And so as existence occurred, it's as if like, honestly, it's like this sound. It's as if all we, our simulation of existence is the voice of God. And the reason I say that, because you got to look at how the Big Bang is moving. It's as if like there was something and then something came out of nowhere, as if God shouted and the world was there. And that, that frequency sent
was in actuality a sort of geometrical simulator of a higher dimension. And when I say higher dimension, I mean a dimension that moves beyond the spectrum and hierarchies of living. That means I can talk about it as much as I can. And honestly, when I give these talks, like I'm doing something, to be honest, rebellious to tradition, to traditional spirituality. There's probably, like, if my talks ever find, like, a, a, you know, their true crowd, that true crowd will look at my ideas and there will be some among them who will in some sense feel pity for me in silence. Let me tell you why. Because they feel there is no point to shape an unshapable truth. A truth that has no shape. How can a man shape it? And could a man's voice distract the world? And I had this impression, I, I had this hesitation because when I was much younger, I would see different speakers, and especially my father was a huge role in my life. You know, he, he would do public speaking, you know, and he would do public speaking about uh, very unique things of, of a very, very profound spiritual context rooted in his own experiences through life, you know. And... Uh, this origination of a design that intelligently changes is as, it's as if the universe is speaking and our minds are being worlds something like that i mean that's like that's the poetic way i hope this talk has helped you i don't feel like i still feel unsatisfied in truly having explained the value of the title right so i'm going to go through it bit by bit until i suddenly see the pattern in it right okay so let's say you you see this title eternal visitations of the dawn of man let me assume let me assume i'm re seeing this title for the first time so i would say eternal visitations which means a cycle that repeats and when I say eternal, eternal really relates to a sort of, a per, it's more of a personal concept. Infinite is a more impersonal concept, right? You know, like the, we have the concept of an eternal being, right? Like an eternal mind. These notions uh, are suggesting they relate to a sort of individualness, right? But infinite doesn't necessarily relate to an individualness. It's just the quality of the world. You know, eternity is a sort of experience of the world. Infinity relates to the existential value. You know, uh, eternity relates to the experiential value of matter. Right? So uh, eternal visitations, it means repetitions. Right? So I kind of went through this. And then of the dawn of man. So as if the endless awakening of various different forms of species after we're extinct as a sort of universal pattern occurring everywhere because for me i had this theory and it was a very profound one of those mr within theories you know one of those things i felt i i saw through a telescope of contemplation that nobody had and in some sense it was this notion that how can eternity be eternal to itself unless it sees the temporary, thus rendering eternity and infinity also an illusion? I just concluded this right now, guys. I just noticed something about this. So I feel that there's greater things even beyond a sort of eternal uh, satisfaction of a sort of behavioral... Uh, rhythm of the person's identity as if like you're living in this life with a certain way of looking at things and you want this to continue on you know well guess what it's it shouldn't you know nobody can tell nature what to do you know especially the ants under a rock called you know earth <laughs> for me i find that uh um i i feel i understand like the title pretty much i'm saying like let us not forget the value of moments 
where even though we may feel we cannot escape the hamster wheel of karma, <laughs> okay, but there are moments where there is pureness experience. Every person, you cannot live a lifetime without having an enlightening moment. It just, it, it, you cannot. I don't know why people are so obsessed over enlightenment. You know, enlightenment, it, 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 it's, it's more of like, an effect of a sort of cause. It is a sort of kind of updating of what you could not see before and now you can. Don't be fooled by methodologies that promise something in the unknown that you can't see. Rather, be curious about your own design. Become, a, become that designer that's studying the design of your moment of being your moment that you're here right now, and you will instantaneously access a state of being that is collective, and you're going to get access to like endless designs, which is, I poetically and very playfully in 2010, wrote a book on this, I called it the inventor's sphere. It's pretty much like I very playfully in that book explained it like this sphere, like the center of existence where all and like endless designs are just emanating like the beams of the sun. Uh, you know, that in some sense, the sun's light beam, this was the theory I wanted to point out er earlier, the, the light of the sunbeam is not just, it doesn't have only sensory value, it has a sort of uh, uh, share, like I, I, I feel we, we evolve not just because of our m material roots, also because of our relationship with light, and not just an abstract way or in a physical way, in a way where light was non-stop being a sort of energetic shower of various patterns. Anyways, one may boundary, but when you wonder about the boundary, beyond the boundary, what do you feel? You will feel a sort of courage to stand your truth because truth is not sometimes something you find it is it is something you create through an honest relationship an authentic moment of living and so it's a it's a new reformatting of your again the unknown and the known thing you know and the moment your vision goes on a vast scale like you become you you, you see you have depth Okay, you realize this thing of, of zooming in and zooming out of realities, right? And you begin to see that if sometimes when we get emotional, we have zoomed in, we have made something personally related, relate to us. But sometimes you zoom out and you make something not relate to you at all. And that's kind of meditation where through, the more as silent and still the person is throughout their day, just listen, like forget all, like every other concept and just listen to me just for 20 minutes. I say 20 minutes, but don't worry about the time, whatever you feel is natural, but I recommend 20 minutes. Right, so if you want to like do it the way I'm saying, just for 20 minutes, go sit, okay, and be still and silent, and li for like 20 minutes of your waking day, just don't do anything, don't think about anything, don't even think like you're meditating or whatever, just exist, just just look at how you're existing in the moment, just be aware, just have a, a moment throughout your life where you appreciate this that what you see can be as significant as the world you see that significance in. You don't understand. We are living externally in the most abundant and advanced technological period, but internally we are breaking ourselves as if the external world is uh, evolving our inner worlds are devolving through a sort of doubt, self-doubt, because the game is being projected bigger. Because let me tell you, when I was born, I said a statement earlier that I think when I was born, like I was an atheist. Let me tell you this. No, I was nothing. I was no con I wasn't concept based. Beliefs are just people's just momentary identification with the sort of conceptual self they have. 
you know, the, it's not that it's valueless, but its value can always be adjusted. So most people have to adjust in like you, you got in, like, let me tell you this, this is the problem with dictators and this is the problem with like power, right? The problem with power is that the person wants the world they see in their head they, they want the external world, they want the objective realm to abide by the subjective realm. They want the external world to have to listen to their inner world, right? So they're trying to make their inner world a reality in the outer, right? And now there's balances to this and there's appropriateness and inappropriateness. But like, for example, Hitler, he was like, rather than me going with the flow of the world, the world has to go with the flow of the world I think in my head. Like one dude was like, all right, I'm going to make everybody listen to me. Like, like, damn, <laughs> you know, but it depends on the message as well. Right. And so unfortunately, Hitler, I don't know, he wanted to, I guess, like when he was younger, I don't think he experienced power. What a shame. <laughs> but anyways, like, th that's the thing, right? That, uh. You. Yeah, that, that your inner world, if you try to make the outer world have to listen to your inner world, you're going to have karmic turbulence, you know, in trying to pilot your consciousness that way. And in some sense, you got to realize the truth of your ego. You got to realize that idea you have of yourself. What is it? What is being it? Is it being you? Is a thought being you or are you being and then thoughts are appearing based on your attention and energy levels? Every being is a unique, unique energetic expression kept. One can say that gravity is the center of the gravity of this universe let's say all this universe spiritually is going towards one core, one core thing, that core is not in this dimension. One can very playfully say black holes are doors that we have no way of knowing how to enter through. Anyways, I hope this talk has served you. Blessed be the dawn of mankind will come and go. However, the light of truth, whether it dies or fails, it will be reborn. Chaos and order will dance until freedom has remembered its true nature. I hope this talk is served. Whew. <laughs>